Hi there. So I've had a great time in the past couple of days seeing the reactions and comments to my talk with uh, Jonathan Paja. Uh, a couple of people think I'm a hippie, which is which is pretty funny. But I guess they have a point in one regard. Like Sylvan Bear, I'm a big fan of Zap comics, and that's a commenter on uh, Paul's Paul Vanderclay's response to that video. So Robert Crumb did a fabulous Genesis graphic novel, by the way. It's real. It's a real classic. Uh, I enjoyed Paul's reaction video a lot. He really got it right about the problem we spiritual secular types are having with the big G. And I guess my underlying framework is maybe I don't want to relinquish metaphysical control, even though that control is obviously <laughs> a complete illusion. I mean, quality is pre-intellectual. I'm so grateful to Jonathan Peugeot for having me on his channel, um, but I do have a couple of regrets, and one of them is I didn't, I really wanted to express my appreciation for his artwork. He's just such a stellar, you know, he's just such an excellent artist, and, uh, but I guess I did think that 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 classic piece of medieval art was his because um, his his work is as good as that, obviously. So I guess that's kind of a compliment in a way. And the other thing that I regret is um, is I wanted to make a comparison between, or at least mention how important the mountain, the the symbolism of the mountain is in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance because. Anyone who's even listened to uh, or watched one or two of Jonathan's videos will probably pick up on how important the symbolism of the mountain is in uh, in traditional Christian symbolism. Um, it figures prominently in, into Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. For example, the high country of the mind, where he goes to figure stuff out. Beartooth Pass, uh, a particular place that, that has uh, mystical qualities. Um, the mountain he's going to be climbing in chapters coming up uh, for the Indian pilgrimage when he's in India, which compares the climbing experience of a non-believer to that of a believer. And also when he, when he loses his mind, he uses the metaphor of rocks coming loose at the top of the mountain and plummeting down and causing an avalanche. So... Um, but the good thing is that opens up an opportunity for a comparison video between Jonathan's view of the mountain, the traditional Christian view of the mountain, compared to Piercix, and I think that that will be a lot of fun. Another thing, um, and I know I show a lot of books all the time. It's not to, to demonstrate how intelligent I am, <laughs> because I'm not, but it's, to, um, it's because I have a tendency to overread a few books um, and get really hung up on them and of course uh, and then use them to inform a lot of stuff I don't know if that's good or bad but that's just the way it is and this chaos book is one of them and so let's I, I, this has really been been uh, bugging me so um, there's something called the, the chaos theory has a whole lot of um, of ways of expressing itself in its dynamical systems theory. And this is, uh, Edward Lorenz is one of the great, um, great uh, theorists using dynamical systems theory, to explain dynamical systems theory. This here, I hope you can see it, is what they call the Lorenz water wheel. And um, what happens is, water steadily streams and it turns the wheel in a uh, in a predictable systematic way but when uh, when the water when it becomes too fast when it becomes too chaotic the wheel the wheel actually reverses so think about the topsy-turvy world of Piercic in chapter 14 and think about Jonathan Pajot's upside down uh, fragmented chaotic world I think that I I don't I can't draw a conclusion obviously but really that's kind of interesting thing to think about so and then of course the book that I'm always bringing up uh, this one so one reason I, I find this really interesting okay let me just show you really quickly something that one would need to know about uh, about Putnam's 
work um, is that this this is the state space of um, of personality. This self esteem goes up this way, um, energy goes this way, and this is and uh, all the way back to front is emotion. So these are these represent. I hope you can see it. The different um, the different states that let's let's just say this is a particular person who uh, who is a creative person, and you can see how the different states cycle. And this this line demonstrates the cycling of the states of you know the the frag the different parts of their personality. Um, grief, creativity, passion, uh, anger, etc., depression. So what's really interesting is that um, the states, this is another Lorenz, um, Lorenz diagram. This is the uh, state space plot of Lorenz butterfly equations. So these are, these are strange attractors. And um, they, these, they, they create, uh, I, I can't explain this all really um, because I don't know well enough, but what happens is that when you're in a particular, this is just a, this is in dynamical systems theory. So this is, this is how, this is the uh, pattern of state switching in personality. You switch from one state to another via these strange attractors, which are the states. So you remain here in a while, and there is an actual systematic um, switch to another strange attractor, which will be another state of mind. Um, so, so Putnam is using, is saying that this dynamical, uh, this dynamical pattern is what governs our personality. Basically, it's at the bottom of it because we go from one state to another um, through this dynamical systems pattern. Uh, I, I'm still just figuring that out, so so that's the best I can do for the time being. So remember that Verveke, of course, this is in um, this is in episode uh, six, uses Alicia Herraro's theory of dynamical systems to um, to demonstrate how things develop and grow, and and this is an advance of Newton's causality. In dynamical systems, you have causal events and you have uh, constraints that make the conditions for potentiality. So I think the train metaphor in Piercig can can be linked to this. First of all, let me just read the train section. It's a little long, so I'm sorry. Um, I've edited out some stuff that that doesn't matter for what we're using it for now. But I want to just put the train metaphor out there because uh, I described it in the Pajot video, but I just want to read it because I think it's really important to understanding for understanding what Piercing meant. Um, and remember that I'm going to use the language of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, but remember later in, in Lila, the, the, the term romantic knowledge becomes dynamic quality and classic knowledge becomes static, static patterns of value or static quality. Uh, in my mind now is an image of a huge long railroad train, one of those 120 boxcar jobs that cross the prairies all the time with lumber and vegetables going east, with automobiles and other manufactured goods going west. I want to call this train knowledge and subdivide it into two parts, classical, classic knowledge and romantic knowledge. In terms of the analogy, classic knowledge, the knowledge taught by the Church of Reason. Remember, if you want to know about the Church of Reason, uh, it's in chapter 14. I talk about it in my video on part one. Uh, the knowledge taught by Church of Reason is the engine and all the boxcars, all of them and everything that's in them. If you subdivide the train into parts, you will find no romantic knowledge anywhere. And unless you're careful, it's easy to make the presumption that all the train, that, that that's all the train there is. Because there isn't, uh, this isn't because romantic knowledge is non-existent or even unimportant. It's just that so far the definition of the train is static and purposeless. 
This is two whole dimensions of existence. It's two whole ways of looking at the train. Romantic quality, in terms of this analogy, isn't any part of the train. It's the leading edge of the train, the two-dimensional surface of no real significance unless you understand that the train isn't a static entity at all. The train really isn't a train if it can't go anywhere. The process of examining the train and subdividing it uh, into parts, we're inadvertently st we've inadvertently stopped it, so it really isn't a train that we're examining. That's what we're stuck. The real train of knowledge isn't a static entity that can be stopped and subdivided. It's always going somewhere on a track called quality. And that engine and all those 120 boxcars are never going anywhere except where the track of quality takes them and romantic quality, the leading edge of the engine, takes them along that track. Romantic quality is the cutting edge of experience. It's the leading edge of the train of knowledge that keeps the whole train on track. Traditional knowledge is only the collective memory of where the leading edge has been. At the leading edge, there are no subjects, no objects, only the track of quality ahead. And if you have no, no formal way of evaluating, no way of acknowledging quality, the entire train has no way of knowing where to go. Okay, so think for a moment about Verveke's, uh when he was talking about Elise Herrera's potentiality and kind of apply that. You don't have pure reason, you have pure confusion. The leading edge is where absolutely all the action is. The leading edge contains all the infinite possibilities of the future. It contains all the history of the past. Where else could they be contained? The past cannot remember the past. The future cannot generate the future. The cutting edge of this instant right now is always nothing less than the totality of everything there is. You see that's sort of a mystical way of looking at things in the now, but it's not mystical at all when you put it in this context. So, so that's another thing that's really interesting about Piercing is his ability to, um, to, to infuse the mystical, ephemeral, romantic with the structural classic. And so think about what, again, let's go back to what John Dravecki said about causal events and constraints. Dynamic quality is a pre-intellectual instant event. Uh, the, train are the, the train is the constraints moving forward on the track of quality. The quality event causes the tree branch, uh, the tree branch to branch its leaves out towards the sun, and the sun allows the tree to grow. This is romantic quality guiding the leaves, which are organized classically, and the quality uh, helps the structure uh, transform and grow, because it, it directs it's the stimulus towards the sun. Dynamic quality is how these static patterns, the leaves, are updated, how the tree grows. The stimulus is romantic or dynamic, and the structure is classic or static. And I think there's something in here, um, uh, this may be the way I can link Putnam and Piercig, which is uh, really uh, grating at me. I really want to do that. And um, so, Remember that in Putnam's book, again, the dynamic switches of personality is that of the strange attractor in, in chaos theory. So Paul Vanderclay said he ordered that book, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say. He's going to be pleasantly surprised by this book in other ways, but I'm not, I'm not going to give it away. So um, another thing about theory, um, this is all coming together. Another thing about chaos theory that is so interesting, and fractals. So most people know, I mean, a lot of people know what fractals are. Fractals are, um, I, I don't know well enough how to explain how they originate, but the point of fractals is that they are the same pattern all the way down and all the way up. That it's an un, invariant, um, invariant structure, an invariant pattern, all the way down, all the way up for infinity, basically. So that has a lot of implications in terms of, um, some of the things that occur in um, in in religion, so like like the reason that the Pajot brothers use that um, metaphor, that analogy 
for what they're talking about because God is in everything and God creates everything the whole and the particular you see this pattern come up all the time for example in in Tao in the Tao Te Ching the Tao is the great void that is the mother of 10,000 things and it's very similar in Piercing's metaphysics of quality which is you know the, the way that it's conceptualized later in Lila that the smallest non-organic particle in the cosmos has, has a quality detector and it builds from that all the way up to where we are now. Um, dynamic quality is omnipresent, omniscient, and, omnip and omnipotent if you want to put it that way. It's always been there so I know what, what Paul Vanderclay would say about that. <laughs> it's all the way above and all the way at the very bottom. Also um, in, in the response video Paul mentioned uh, the romantic. Uh, so I'm reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance again because I need to pick out some particular stuff for a project coming up in a couple weeks. So I just came across this quote. This is Henri, uh, this is about Henri Poincaré who I harp on and on about. This is a true aesthetic feeling which all mathematicians know, Poincaré said, but of which the profane are so ignorant as often to be tempted to smile. But it is this harmony, this beauty that is at the center of it all. So Poincaré made it clear he was not speaking of romantic beauty, the beauty of appearances which strikes the senses. He meant classic beauty, which comes from the harmonious order of the parts and which pure intelligence can grasp. Okay, think about what Verveke says about intelligence, which gives structure to romantic beauty and without which life would be only vague and fleeting, a dream from which one could not distinguish one's own dream, um, one's dreams because there would be no basis for making that distinction. It is the quest of the special classic beauty, the sense of harmony of the cosmos, which makes us choose the facts most fitting to contribute to this harmony. It is not the facts, but the relation of, of things that results in the universal harmony. That is the sole objective reality. So a lot of implications there. And and you can see the issue taken with Verveke of the romantics that, that it's vague, vague and fleeting. They have woo-woo, but they don't have structure, and you need both. And that is what Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is, is about in a lot of ways. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> guess who's considered the founder of dynamical systems theory? Henri Poincaré. So you see how things are lining up here. Um, now I want to go into some viewer comments. So there's a viewer called Mary Cochan, I, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right who has uh, been on Paul Vanderclay's channel and she's very smart and helpful and she's helping me with uh, understanding some of the uh, Christian concepts. But she's also reading my mind because I was watching the dialogue, when the dialogue between Paul and Jonathan first came out, Jonathan said something that was so piercing and I, I made a note of it and minutes later I got an alert that Mary left me a comment that I should pay attention to that exact part. And so another thing, lately um, I've, been, I've been working on understanding Piercek's relationship with rationality, and he said that rationality itself needs to be updated. And I was struggling to figure out what that means, and I realized we're not, um, lo we're not any longer in need of the type of rationality that excludes the subjective and sees only the objective as true. Um, I mean, as rationality as a whole. What we need is a rationality that gives coherence. And um, the other day I noticed that Mary left me a comment that said, uh, for the ancient Greeks, rationality is intelligibility. Mind reader. So I just had to share that. Um, the second comment, the second viewer who is making important comments is, of course, Lee Glover, who goes by the... Um, who goes by the handle 77 Lee LG, and he has some supplemental material on Chapter 14, Part 2, which I neglected to mention, where he points out additional stuff that I missed, including what he characterizes to be the best line in the book. So I'm not going to tell you what that is. You go look at what he says. Definitely read his comments, because remember, he's not only a Piercing expert, but he's really adept at understanding the root and the geography um, in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So he adds an additional dimension of interest to the uh, narrative part of the book. Um, so this is really useful for understanding uh, the chapter. 
And speaking of commentators, there's another viewer called Mo Deeb who, who understands this stuff inside and out. And he's been really helpful in clarifying some of Pearson's work to, um, to people making comments in the American inquiries in the comments section. And sometimes I'll see a comment, I'll be like, oh God, how am I going to answer that? Fortunately, he comes in and, and, and does it. He's, his style is a little, um, uh, don't get mad at me, Modi. His style is a little cryptic. Um, so you have to read it a couple of times sometimes to get what he's saying, but you can't, but, but just like go over it a couple of times and, uh, and you'll get it and you'll get it in a way that, that really clarifies things. And he'll, if you don't understand what he's saying, he'll clarify. He's very good about that. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say, uh, Paul said the meaning crisis is in the secular world. And I hadn't really thought about this. So you could say there are some major problems in the Islamic world, for example, in Africa, in uh, Hindu India, and they may be suffering from poverty, war, unrest, inequality. But do these societies lack, do these people lack meaning? Um, that's an interesting question. I think of <laughs> I think of Jonathan Pajot, a story he told about living in a, a poor African village, and every corner there was a church that someone had, including his neighbor, broadcasting the gospel on the loudspeaker for hours on end to his congregation, which was one boy. <laughs> and Jonathan Pejo said, when I was uh, talking about, you know, the fake it till you make it uh, thing, where, where, where I was talking about, do, do you need to be all the way in, in order to be a true Christian? And he said, you may not need as much of as you think to start the journey. So why is Blaise Pascal ringing, ringing in my ears? I think it's partially from looking at uh, Jonathan Verveke's video on that, but there's a reason Pascal is presenting himself in my salience landscape. So I hope that made sense and I will see you next time.